We're happy to announce that we have just launched the Curious Builder Collective. It is a community of builders looking to enhance their brands and businesses by tapping into the collective expertise of the talented builders in the Minneapolis area. It's a forum for asking questions, exploring ideas, and testing theories, all to help refine and apply these insights to your own business. Our group is a supportive community that rallies behind each other. If you're interested, please head to the CuriousBuilderPodcast.com. Under events, you'll find the Curious Builder Collective. We hope to see you there. This episode is brought to you by Helmuth & Johnson, a top Minnesota law firm ranging from individuals to emerging startups to multinational Fortune 500 companies. Focusing on transactional law, litigation, and appeals, Helmuth & Johnson attorneys are leaders in their field. David Helmuth and Chad Johnson joined forces 30 years ago in 1994 with the goal of creating a premier law firm capable of handling complex and challenging cases efficiently and effectively. Today, Helmuth & Johnson rank among the top 15 largest law firms in Minnesota with more than 70 Twin City lawyers serving clients in more than 30 legal practice areas. They offer a full suite of legal services to clients without sacrificing their original commitment to providing responsive and affordable legal representation. To learn more, go to their website, www.hjlawfirm.com. So today's episode was absolutely amazing. Uh, we had Bell on from LBR Partners, and it was probably one of the most inspiring and motivating and inspirational interviews that I've had to date. Hearing her immigration story from Nicaragua uh, as a five-year-old, you know, basically taking buses, walking across the desert of Mexico, immigrating with her dad from the hardwood floor business where she's, you know, negotiating contracts as a 10-year-old, uh, to having a child at a young age, to starting a career, moving back to Nicaragua and back. I mean, this episode has got it all. Uh, the charisma and the charm and the love that Belle has for even her own people, sponsoring people up here. And, and just you can see it in everything that she says and everything that she does. It, it's really a beautiful listen. So I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. And now on to the episode. Welcome to the Curious Builder Podcast. I'm Mark Williams, your host. Today, I am joined with Belle Cruz. Welcome, Belle. Nice. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm so excited. So we met a couple weeks ago. Uh, actually, you, your team had reached out to me probably three, four months ago asking to come on the podcast. Yeah. And, and I love it when that happens. And so we had never met before. Uh, you're with LBR Partners. And, uh, but we launched kind of this, uh, we'll call it, we're going to call it the Curious Builder Collective, which essentially yeah. is a networking educational thing. And I, I met you there for the first time and your, your joy and your passion just like oozed out of your pores. Aww, and you. so I'm so excited to, to bring you on and, you know, spend a little more time with you in person. Awesome. I'm here for you and I'm here to answer any questions <laughs> and talk about me a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about LBR Partners and, you know, you kind of have an amazing story. One of the things I wanted to hear a little bit about, you're originally from Nicaragua and I'd love to hear kind of your immigration story. I'm always asking people that you know, telling people, you know, we need more women in construction. And in this case, you know, not only are you a woman, which we definitely need, but you're also, you know, a minority in yeah. the state of Minnesota and most of the U.S. And so, you know, a lot of our trade partners, you know, habla espanol. Oh, and so yes. I, we're going to talk a lot about that. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, your immigration story and yeah. kind of how you became a builder and, you know, <laughs> became an entrepreneur, all the things. All the things, right? Um, so, yeah, I came to the U.S. when I was five years old. Um, we migrated from Nicaragua. Um, it was a, a very long, long process to get here, um, actually traveling wise. It took us about, I think it was like three, four months to get to the United States. Um, so when we got here, it was not like, you know, flying over and all of that. It was like the scary things you hear, right? Um, my dad was politically per persecuted in Nicaragua and um, we had to get out. We just had to get out and we had to find a way out. Um, so that, you know, led for him to make a decision. Okay, we're packing our things, we're leaving the country. And we left actually, it was like, or it was like midnight or something, something weird. You know, you watch the, you, you see this stuff in the movies where families are forced to leave their homes in the middle of the night and it's like, let's go. That's essentially what happened to us. That's incredible. How, as a five-year-old, how much were you aware of all these things? Now as an adult, you know, you can, I'm sure think about it differently, but going back as a five-year-old, what, what did you think at that time? You know, at the time, I remember just like, okay, we're leaving. I was like sleeping probably like on my dad's shoulder or something. Um, next thing I remember, I woke up on a bus and I was like, mom, where are we going? And she's like, oh, we're going to go see your uncles. I'm like, okay. And then we get to like Honduras and then I'm like, where are we? And then they're like, oh, we're in Honduras. And I'm like, 
what are we doing here? And we're like, oh, yeah, we're going to see your uncles. And it's like every day we're going to go see your uncles. I'm like, when are we going to get there? <laughs> Did you know where are your uncles in the United States? Yeah, they were oh, in the okay. United States. So um, we were like just, you know, one country to another. We slept in random places. Um, my dad had like the whole plan figured out to like where we were going to stay. I didn't know anybody. Um, our biggest struggle was in Guatemala, getting out of Guatemala into Mexico. Um, we got stopped by the authorities there. Obviously, we didn't have a visa. So this is like illegally crossing countries, right? And what year was this? This was in the 90s, okay. like early 90s. Like So then um, we get to Guatemala and we were stuck in Guatemala for a couple months. Um, I remember uh, being caught by the authorities in Mexico and then um, since we didn't have like any food or anything, they would always be like, la niña primero, the little girl first, she gets water, she gets food, and then everybody else. And then finally, I don't know what happened. Um, we were able to like go through some like really dangerous like waters and I don't know what happened, but we finally made it to Mexico. And then in Mexico, we were able to cross to the U.S. Um, we slept a couple, maybe a week in the desert in the States. Um, yeah, I mean... I remember like my dad digging like holes in, in like the sand and there is like these bushes, like really prickly bushes. And he would like hide us under because there were like helicopters flying and it was just really, it was bad. I wouldn't want my five-year-old to go through that. <laughs> did you have any siblings with you at the time? No, it was just myself and my dad and my mom, just okay. the three of us. What, what did your dad do for a job? In Nicaragua? Yeah. Well, he was in the army. Okay. He was and, in the army. Yeah. yeah. And what was i mean do you remember feeling fear i mean what was the feeling i mean did you feel like you were in this four month game of hide and seek i mean yeah. what was what were the feelings that you were experiencing i was um at night i was scared i was cuz i would hear like howling and i would hear all sorts of noises and i was just like oh my gosh what is that like i want to go home and um i had this like one blanket that they didn't bring and i'm like i want my blanket um, and then, yeah, it was just, I remember being very scared at one point, like during the nights in the desert. Um, and then we had to walk for days and it was just, it was insane. Um, but finally we made it to the States and we made it to New Jersey and that's where my dad, um, you know, just started working there, meeting people. And, um, he started in hardwood floors and shortly thereafter, I think it was about a year or two that he started his own business. Wow. So, and I would go with him on the proposal, like the estimates. So I would help him measure. So you were seven, eight, nine, ten years yeah, old at this point? Yeah. And then I would be able to translate for him. So I was his translator. Did you learn English in Nicaragua or did no. you learn it well after you were already here? Yeah. I learned it here. So I, yeah, kindergarten, I had no like, Well, children idea. are amazingly adept at languages. They so are. That's incredible that, wow. Amazing. <laughs> so, I mean, that's also really just neat that you got to experience that firsthand with your dad. I mean, as he's this kind of this, I mean, truly a coming to America fleeing persecution. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anyone firsthand like this. Um, what a, I mean, what a brave family and a brave thing to do. What did, what was your mom doing then during this time? When we were traveling? When, no, I'm... when you were, now that you're through into New Jersey. So your dad, you know, worked for hardwood. It sounds like he started his own hardwood flooring company yep. and then was your mom supporting that or was she what was she doing oh she was supportive 100 percent. she was more of a stay-at-home mom she you know made sure everything ran at home and and she's always been kind of just you know that that support behind the scenes person yeah, yeah. oh that's much needed how yeah. did you end up having more siblings or are you the only child no we did well we did <laughs> my parents did <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I have a brother who is, um, he's 31. I, yeah, he's about 31. Um, and yeah, he's also in construction. <laughs> oh my. So walk us through those early years. So you're, you know, well, most kids are worried about third and fourth grade, you know, here you are helping your dad run a business. What were some of those things, things that you learned? And, you know, we'll get into it later with your remodeling company that, you know, that you essentially apply to your future business. But walk us through those early years of, of you know, not only you're translating, but you're helping measure. I mean, you're running a business as a child. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's funny. Um, so I would go with him to like on-site measures all the time. I would meet with uh, contractors. And um, I remember him always saying like, that's going to be you one day. And I'm like, never, like, I'm not going to, you know, but I would see it so differently in my head because I would see these white big males, you know, running the, you know, the show like builders and everything. And I'm like, 
me, this little girl, like I'm going to be that. Like I was taking it literally. And so, but I was already doing all the things. I mean, I was talking to these people. I was measuring. We were talking pricing like, oh, no, I want it for, you know, this much. And da, 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 you know, so I already knew like the lingo behind it all. Um, and then after, you know, after some time, I remember when computers came out, my first, when I turned 15, it was like, do you want a quinceanera or do you want something else? And I'm like, I want a computer. <laughs> like, I want to do the invoices on the computer. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> um, so I'm like, I'm tired of handwriting. And then in high school, we are like, it's I Such a practical thing for a 15 year old. <laughs> I want to be able to do my invoicing at speed. That's, yeah. what, that's what I would like for my birthday. That's what I want. And so we got it. But um, I learned a lot from every every aspect of the business, especially from him being a man that only had third grade education to running a successful Harvard Flores business, right? Um, and I learned from him just not to be scared, like not to be afraid, just go for it, take a risk. I don't care if I don't speak English, I'm still gonna go out there and I'm gonna say, hola, like I'm Jose, you want your Harvard Flores done? I'm here for you, you know? And somehow he made it happen. like. His one of his biggest jobs I remember was Fairfield University, um, and it was like a huge gym. And I was like, "Dad, what did you do? How did you get it?" <laughs> He's like, "No, I just came here and I talked to them." I was like, "Okay, like that's that's to me like now it fuels me, you know, because I'm like he did it. I know I can do it, and I'm not going to be afraid to show up and be me and do it, you know." What is an what an amazing example to watch too you know, for a child or for anybody, really, it's super inspiring to hear you know, Jose, right? Yeah, you know, to hear, you know, Jose going and just, you know, asking. And I, I think that that entrepreneurial spirit, I mean, clearly, you ooze it. But even as a child, I have to imagine, I mean, if I was on a job site, and there was a 10 year old speaking to me, like I would because you have a lot of moxie, I and mean, you can just see it in the way you kind of glow when you talk and, and when you smile, just like, I mean, you have a very infectious attitude. If you're anything like your dad, I can imagine I can see instantly why he was six, you know, a lot of charisma. Yeah, he, and, he was very good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He was, is he no longer? No, with us? he is. I oh, mean, okay. but he's in Nicaragua. Oh, okay. So, yeah, he's living his best life in Nicaragua. Okay. Well, good. He was able to make it back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, walk us then through. So, how long did you guys stay in New Jersey? And I guess, how did, at what point in your journey did you realize um, that, you know, you wanted to start your own career and your own business? And how'd you end up in Minnesota? Yeah. So, um, from New Jersey, we moved to Connecticut. New Jersey was getting kind of hectic. A lot of my parents brought a lot of people over. <laughs> like helping oh, everybody sponsor, them and, bring sponsor them, them and they once they got you know legalized they were helping everybody and which is you know something that's been rooted in us um but then the competition just you know kind of dwindled and new jersey is not a very big state either um so harbor floors like it was just you know it's going it was going insane at the time were you was your dad sponsoring people and then also providing them a job within yeah. the building yeah that's a lot of stress too <laughs> i mean not only are you sponsoring someone then providing for their livelihood as a business owner you know you know salary health insurance all these things all I the, mean, yeah. and then as the owner one of the things that people often don't talk about is just you know, it's not a light thing to hire someone or fire somebody because, you know, we are also, you know, I don't want to hire someone only to think that, well, you know, six months down the road, I might have to let them go because I don't have enough work. And so you are you're always kind of doing this balancing act. But obviously on top of it, you know, your dad is, you know, it's a whole nother thing. Like we want to get them out of Nicaragua for, you know, their safety and their life and whatever other, you know, things I can't even hardly imagine. Yeah. Um, how many people did, did he end up sponsoring to, to bring over any idea? Oh my gosh. Um, I want to say like it was probably less than a hundred, but it's, it's, it's a lot of people, Mark. It's that, a lot. That of people. is a lot. How, I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, you hear this all the time and how, what is the process? Do you know the process? Like, how do you sponsor someone to come over? Ta you have to show your taxes. They're going to ask for your taxes. They're going to make sure that you can provide for these people. Um, so there's a threshold of how much you need to make or earn a year and show them that you can at least provide like a housing for them for three months, whether it's in your in your house or somewhere else. Um, the process isn't that hard, um, but just providing the financials and your assets, you have to give them your personal um, financial statement and taxes. I think that's about it. I just did it for someone. So 
How many are, are you? Is that something that you know you and your husband and your family? I mean, is that something that's important to you? Are you still sponsoring yeah, people now? Yeah, we 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 did. I think maybe two, three last year that we helped. Yeah. And do they come for housing? Do they you have them come live with you? Yeah. Nice. As for, family members, or have you at this point? Do you have more than a hundred family members? Or are these at this point? Oh, we have a lot of family members now here. Um, but no, these some of these people we know we knew from back, like not new, but like someone knows them right that they're working on a farm or they just want to better their life and um and then we're just like okay yeah we can help you not mm -hmm. a problem is it have you worked with any other like nonprofits or any other agencies to sort of you know either broaden the reach or kind of have other resources to help or you've always kind of just done it on your own i've just done it on my own um i'm reaching out to other nonprofits, but on a different matter um more like in educating subcontractors like how to run their business how to like have everything that they need to run a successful business. Um, but that's, yeah, that's a, that's a different thing. That's another podcast. <laughs> yeah. How, so, okay. So now you're in Connecticut. Um, I guess, how did you get then? So you, you, I guess get us back to Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. So after I graduated, um, I got accepted at U of M and then my dad was like, okay, well, let's go see this. Cause being a Latino man, it's like, my only daughter is now going to be living in Minnesota. What? Like, no, we have to figure this out. So we drove out here one summer and, you know, looking at everything. And then he was like, oh, this is really nice. And, you know, it's summer. Everything's green and everything's beautiful. And then he was like, what do you think if we just move here? And I'm like, hmm, I don't know. I'm like, it looks good. And then we just started, you know, I'm like, but then what about the business? And he was like, oh, don't worry. He's like, we could start a subcontractors here. It's not a problem. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. So then I started reaching out to other hardwood floors companies. Are you guys hiring subs? And when we first got here, not a lot of people like to hire subs. What year was this? This was uh, 2004, 2000, yeah, 2004. Okay. Um, well, I'm talking about like flooring companies. They didn't really hire subcontractors or maybe not us i don't know they just had it like in-house in-house yeah they had their in-house crews um and we went to a lot of them and finally we got like two that were interested and we're like okay yeah so we brought our vans and our equipment you know switched did all the legal paperwork um how many people did you bring with you that was working with your dad at that time it was about eight eight okay yeah it was eight people and they followed and you know it's funny that one of them um I remember his name was Mario Rocha, if you're listening. <laughs> and now they have Rocha Hardwood Floors, his son, and they have like about two, three vans and they're like just booming. Here like, in Minnesota. Here in Minnesota. Oh, that's great. So yeah, it just, you know, it trickled. Um, and I and I really love that. But um, so yeah, then that's how we ended up here in Minnesota. And after that, um, a lot of things happened. <laughs> uh, I... Uh, went through some personal things. I got pregnant at 19 and my dad was not happy. So then he just left. Oh, your dad did? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. This is, this, that, that took a That's turn. a good turn, right? Yeah, From like, turn. Things, This is like the idyllic story. And like everything's it's like, one way boom. and then boom. Yeah. So he left like back for Nicaragua? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. He did. He, he, he hard dropped that mic. Yeah, he, he really did. And you know what? It's one of those things where our culture, people handle things differently. And I don't blame him because that's the way he was probably taught. Like, you got yourself in a situation, you're going to get yourself out and you're going to figure it out. Um, so I don't hold any grudges or anything because what can I expect? You know, right. can't sit there all my life and be like, you should have helped me. And right. um, but yeah, he left me alone. And the the thing he didn't do, though, he didn't shut down the business. He didn't do any of that. So I just kind of was like, okay. And this is, you're still in college at this point? Yeah. You're 19. So you're a freshman. I'm a freshman. Um, I had to quit Yeah. Yeah. because I, I couldn't, I couldn't do both. Um, so then I had to pay rent. I, there was just so much going on. I'm like, I need money. And you're, you're like, pregnant. And I was pregnant. And all the things as a, you know, I can only, I can't imagine. <laughs> so then I started driving around. I remember um, since my dad left, none of the, the contractors wanted to work with me. Right. And so they're like, where's your dad? Because like, you didn't have the same experience as you had when you were in New Jersey where you were doing all the brokering and all that type of at that And time. I did do it. I okay. mean, at one point, but they were just like, where's Jose? Where's Jose? And I'm like, well, he's on vacation. You know, he'll be back. Well, when he gets back, you know, let's talk. And I'm like, okay. Um, but then that didn't stop me. 
I just went on Grand Avenue, St. Paul, and I started knocking on like all these old buildings. And I'm like, do you guys need hardwood floors for turnovers? And then this one girl was like, yeah, I'll pay you 800 bucks per apartment. I'm like, done. <laughs> so like, Anything to make it go. Yeah. And we did it. So I had like buildings on Grand Ave that we um, did all the hardwood floors on. Amazing. Wow. What a persevering story. <laughs> How, so walk us through then these next couple of years. So you obviously went straight into business and, and kind of in sense followed your dad's footsteps and like not be afraid. I'm yeah. just going to ask what what's the worst I have to lose, right? Exactly. What's um, the worst? So he, your mom, I assume went with your dad as well and your brother, did he stay? Or? No, they, they took him too. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> wow, I don't hardly even know what to say. How, how did you, at that time, did you feel, I mean, were you just pretty locked in? Like, there's a baby coming, I need a business. Like, were you even processing? I mean, now it's, you know, 20 years later, 15 years later, whatever. A lot it of is. years of therapy later. A lot no, of years of, well, no, for sure. I mean, I can't, that's so traumatic and, and so scary. I mean, having, you know, raising, you know, a child alone without your family and all the things that, I mean, you've, wow. How, so what were those, those first months like? At what point did, things stabilize and you know did you end up getting married then or what how did that haul unveil when did the baby came how you ran the business walk us through those years okay so i oh my gosh so much happened i couldn't continue because i was driving one of the crews the other crew um the one that was the driver his wife ended up having a baby and he needed to be there for her and then things just kind of like exploded and everybody had to find a way to do things and then um when I was about almost due, um, my dad then came back and just dis like dis did everything. <laughs> he undid the company and um, what's the word I'm looking for when they like dissolve the company. Yep. There you go. Um, and then he started selling off everything. So I wasn't able to tap into that anymore. Um, so after that, the baby came, then my mom, we, we talked and we kind of, you know, everything was fine. And then she was like, okay, well, I'm going to move back and help with the baby. And I'm like, okay. So then I had support. Then I started looking for work. So then I started, I just got a job. Um, I started cleaning at St. Paul Academy. Um, and so I was a janitor for a long time, which I hated. I hated that job. And not that I didn't work before. You know, I always worked for my dad and I always had part-time jobs. But that job to me, I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't be, I can't believe I'm doing this. At one point, I remember going into like, it was St. Paul Academy, um, the elementary school, because they have two. They have the upper, which is the high school, and then they have the for the little kids. And one bathroom I had to clean, and there was like a stick figure made out of poop on the mirror. <laughs> oh, no. And I was like, you know, two months like postpartum. So my hormones are everywhere. I'm still like, doing all the mommy things, pumping in every, you know, every couple hours. And I remember just like breaking down. I'm like, oh, like, what am I doing? Like I felt so, and not saying that janitors are, you know, it's a demeaning job, no. But for me, right, for me, I felt like I was meant for more. And then I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Like, and this was like, a, you know, like 20 something. Um, and yeah, from there, I don't know what, oh, so someone came in from the office, from the janitor company that I worked. And then, um, she was like, Hey, she's like, you speak Spanish. I'm like, yeah, I do. She's like, can you translate for me? And I'm tra telling other, you know, another employee how to do things. I'm like, sure. So I start translating and she's like, do you know how to use a computer? I'm like, yeah, I'm like great at invoicing. <laughs> 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 and, um, so next thing she's like, you know, in the office, they're looking for a receptionist. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, so I take Anything that. Anything to be done with being a janitor. <laughs> I don't want to clean poop. Um, and so I go into the office and I started as receptionist and then it just kind of snowballed from there. The office manager left and then she was doing HR, she was doing payroll, she was doing like a lot of things. Um, and then I learned from marketing um, and I took over that. And then when I left, I was like in operation. So I was like running every aspect of the business. Like I felt that I was doing it all. Um, and that job taught me so much on how a business runs. Like, cause we were doing okay, but it wasn't like a, an enterprise where we had like offices and it was, you know, so we now, I knew now like how to manage, you know, $300,000 in payroll every month. Like I knew a lot at that point. Um, 
and still didn't, you know, I never got to go back to school. Well, not never, but I did end up going back, but not for what I wanted to do. Um, what did you, what did you want to do? I want to do business, but then I also had like this creative side, like, and so I went for graphic design. <laughs> That's great. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It just, I, I went back just to get it over and done with. Um, and then, but my passion has always been kind of like the being the boss. <laughs> well, it's amazing. You, I mean, you essentially were an entrepreneur at age 10 for all those years helping your dad. Then you move, you know, an entrepreneur again. Then obviously everything you, you know, for let's call it eight or nine months ran the business. And then it's like you went back to square one. Yeah. I can imagine why that was so shocking for not even all the personal reasons, but just from a business standpoint, right? You I know, think that's what it was. You own the business and now you've been running a business for six, seven years and now you're a janitor. And like, and all of a sudden, like, whoa! I'm cleaning poop off of a mirror, and not. And then all of a sudden, then you. But amazingly, from a viewpoint, I have to imagine, you know, it's kind of like when people go to school, you know, get you know, have a career, and then go back to get the MBA. How much more beneficial it is, I've been told, to get your your MBA after you have the experience to relate it to, versus someone that goes through school and just gets your MBA don't have that life experience. I mean, you have a life experience in. Sp- Spades. <laughs> and so then to go back and the, but then know what it is to be an entrepreneur, to run a business, but then learn all the things that support a business for, kind of from the inside out. Yeah. That gives you like, some pretty unique experience. The guts of it. Yeah. I, um, from there, I just learned a lot. And then after I left that job, I remember like, I want to start my own business. And I started so many different things. People thought I was crazy. Like I didn't know what, I, I mean, I was only 20 years old, 23, 24 when I left that job. So I gave, you know, three, four years of my life and I learned a lot. And now I was like, okay, I think it's time for me to do something. And um, people, yeah. So you left the job before you knew what you were even going to do? Pretty much. (laughs) Wow. You definitely have no fear. I mean, a lot of people would, you know, try to do a side hustle, see if it works and then kind of do one foot balance, but you just went all in. I I just, I don't know. And it's, probably my crazy side, right? But I wanted to do something and I am like, if I don't do it now and when, you know, are we ever going to be ready? And then, um, I was, I got married too. And that was, and got divorced later. And so young. You're going to have, man, you're going to have like a series of books for sure. This is not a one book right? memoir. And so, um, and then my husband at the time loved Nicaragua and Nicaragua was safe back then, like in the like early two thousands. And then they're like, let's move. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, but what am I going to do over there? And I started photography business and and the side as well. Of course you did. Um, and so I loved photography and I did that. I'm like, okay, well I could do that in Nicaragua. And then when I got to Nicaragua, I was like, okay, yeah, I did it. Did a couple weddings. It was great. Not enough. Um, but then someone was like, Hey, a nonprofit is looking for, um, director of finances. So you actually moved or you were just there for a short while? Oh, you moved. We moved for like two I lived there for almost four years um, and then worked for the nonprofit there. So I learned the whole shebangs of how nonprofits run and I was managing the budgets and I was doing all the finances and putting systems in place. There was a lot of things missing. There was no HR department. There was no really accounting. There was a lot of things that needed work. Um, So I did that and, you know, the divorce happened during Nicaragua times. And then shortly, like maybe a year or so later, I met my husband, Rafael. And then I dragged him to Minnesota. <laughs> You're like, we have to get out of Nicaragua. <laughs> We're going back. Yeah. And he was like, I, I'm like, let's go to Minnesota. And he was like, what are we going to do there? I'm like, come on, we'll figure it out. And I'm like, I just, my kids, the education with my kids was crap. And I needed something better. For How them. old? So when you left, your it was it a son or a daughter? Your first? My first was a son. A son. And so he would have been what, five or six? When he you was, went? About six, yeah. And then, and then coming back, did you have you had additional children at this time or no? Mm-hmm. Okay, I had two more. Two more. Okay, so now you've got three, three, the three amigos, <laughs> and Raphael, who we'll get to later, is a tango dancer and chess player. I want yes. to hear a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, so you come back to Minnesota, and and that's what? when it started. And that's, and that's when, when it started. It, uh, and then I was like, he said, "I'm not going to work for anybody," and I'm like, "You don't have to." Like, was this before or after the recession of two thousand eight, nine, ten? Um, this was after. Okay. Yeah. Um, this was recently, like maybe 2015, 14, 15. 
If we cram so many l- yeah, years times. of life into this that I'm, I'm having a hard time tracking, I need like I a, need a, a timeline. I need a map, and I also need a you know a globe of North and South America to track your travels. It's like forget where's uh, Carmen San Diego, right. you know where's Bell Cruz, where's Bell Cruz. <laughs> Um, so yeah, in Nicaragua, um, oh, so I was about to give birth and I was still paying for health insurance here. I wasn't, I didn't want to have a baby. (laughs) No offense to anybody listening, but the public health or the hospitals there were just, oh my gosh. Um, and then actually, no, I was about to do it, but then the OB said, no, you're getting a C-section and that scared me. And I'm like, no, why do I need one? And so I, I'm knowing me, right? I have like a thousand questions and I'm like, I'm not going to do just what you tell me to do. Like I need proof of why I need it. And well, it's like, I'm your doctor. I know what's best. I'm like, "Mm, nah. I'm like, babe, let's go to Minnesota. (laughs) I'm still paying for this. Like, let's just go. And he was like, okay. So when I came here and then um, my son was having a hard time with school in Nicaragua. Um, And then while we're here, calls me like mom and I was only going to be here for four weeks like give birth and get on a plane and go back and then um we were just like he's like I just don't get it I don't understand they want to hold me back again and I'm like oh my gosh Aiden I'm so sorry like we're gonna make this work he had tutors and everything but and you know so at that point I was just like I can't do this to him he's meant for much more and like I don't want him held back you know because of what so um we got him here and we all just, and then I told Raf, and I'm sorry, babe, you have to hear this, but I was like, either you stay or you go, like, it's up to you, but I'm staying. Like, I have to stay here for my son and for my kids. Like their education to me is way more important. Like, I love you, but it, it's up to you. Um, and then he was like, hmm. he's like, well, cause he has, he worked with his dad and they have a business in Nicaragua and it's a whole thing. Um, but what, then- What business was that? They do, they think they have like rice farms okay. and then they had tobacco farms and they also have uh, like cattle, um, like a cattle farm. And yeah, so he was like, okay, well, I'm going to stay. Just know my dad's not going to be happy. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, but I, I promise we will make it through. We will do something worthwhile to make everybody proud. Everybody's going to be okay. And he's like, promise. I'm like, I promise. And then, um, yeah, then I just started calling people. I called my one of my cousins who did Harbor Floors. I'm like, hey, you have a job for my husband? Like, let's let's do something here. And then he was like, yeah, I could give him a job. I just don't have enough work. And I'm like, don't worry. Leave it up to me. I'll get you work. And then he was like, what? I'm like, don't worry. <laughs> I just got on the phone, started making calls, found him more work. He was working. He was learning Harbor Floors. And I met another contractor. I'm like, hey, do you need someone you know, to help out? And then he was like, actually, I do. And I'm like, honey, do you want to go work with him for a while? Like learn, you know, the ins and outs and everything. And he was like, okay. Um, And then he started working with the other contractor. And then I started doing roofing sales and siding sales. For a company or For another company. Okay. Um, And then I was technically their sub. And then I was hiring crews and I was doing all the talking. And at one point they had me almost project managing. And I'm like, no, that's not my, <laughs> that's not what I'm supposed to do. But I was like the liaison between the client and the the, the crew. Well, you clearly were incredibly capable. At this <laughs> point, you've owned like 17 companies and, you know, been in, you know, you've had a number of jobs. I mean, so I can imagine why they'd be like, man, Bella's just killing it. <laughs> just so do let's it. just yeah, Take care do of that, it. do that, do that. <laughs> and I, I, I have a hard time saying no sometimes. So I take on more than I can chew. Um, but then it got to one point where one of, like a couple of contractors didn't pay us and I had already paid everybody. And I was like, mm. and I was like, honey, I think it's time. It's time for us to get our license. And then he was like, you sure? I'm like, why not? I'm like, we, we know what we're doing. You know, you know, everything like we're smart. He's, he was an industrial engineer in Nicaragua. I'm like, we can do this. Um, so then we went in, got our license. Um, and your building license our building license our residential building license and then it was like okay well now how do we get clients and now the the real struggle starts right um well marketing let's start let's advertise let's get this going and then here we are this episode is brought to you by pella northland for 19 and a half years i've been building homes and 95 percent of all of my homes have used pella windows i couldn't be happier to call them a partner in our builds and our remodels whether you're an architect a designer 
or a remodeler, I'd highly recommend Pella Windows. They can fit old homes, new homes, reclaimed, commercial, and really everything in between. Pella is a company that we trust and that we recommend to our clients. Additionally, in management, Peter and Ed have just been absolute fantastic people to work with, as well as mentors to me personally. So when it comes time to look for a window, I'd highly recommend Pella Windows. Find more at PellaNorthland.com. Also, if you're interested, you can hear episode one, where I interview Peter and Ed together for a great listen on business and Pella Windows. This episode is brought to you by Adaptive, the software for builders that automates draws, budgets, and bookkeeping with AI. For over a year now, I've been partnered with Adaptive, and they've just been an amazing game changer in terms of efficiency in our time and all our bookkeeping. When, from the time we get an invoice, we import it into their system. The AI codes it, cost codes it, job codes it. All we have to do is review it, pass it through the people internally in the office, all digitally, and then it gets approved and paid all via ACH. It's becoming extremely fast and saving us countless hours a day and a week. When it comes to draws, all of our budgets now are set in adaptive as well. So now when we cost code against the draws, we can do our change orders. And then with a click of a button, we can submit these draws to our title companies or to our homeowners for faster payment. If you're looking to save time, and if you're looking to be accurate, I highly recommend Adaptive. Additionally, if you'd like to listen to one of their founders share the story of Adaptive, you can listen to episode number 15 on the Curious Builder podcast. Wow. That is quite the <laughs> intro. How I hardly know what to say. Um, how many years ago? So it was LBR Partners. I was born in 2019 as a GC. What? Uh, why LBR Partners? What's the significance behind the initials? Um, so we actually started with Raf's sister and then um, she left shortly, like maybe six, four months into the process. Yeah, it was just too much. Um, and then we just stuck with the name. It's like, why change it? And so we're all partners. Um, I mean, I'm still... I'm like kind of attached because it has a story to it, you know? I'll say. And then I don't want to, I'm like, people are like, well, it doesn't even say your construction. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, I don't know. I'm playing around with the idea of like naming it something different. But for now, that's what it is. So you you do mostly remodeling. Mm -hmm. And how did those, when, when you, obviously you had an incredible, you know, at this point, a career. <laughs> this is like your third career. Uh, you knew how to sell. You knew how to run a business, clearly. What were those first uh, sales like? You know, I mean, again, going back to your natural charisma and, you know, your fearlessness and just, you know, easy, approachable manner. I, it's easy to say yes. And obviously being bilingual, you know, did that help you with some of your first clients, Spanish speaking? Uh, walk us through those early sales and how you sold yourself and what kind of objections did you have and how often did people say no and what did you learn from some of those experiences? Oh my gosh, I heard no all the time in the beginning. Um, it was kind of discouraging at first and, but I, you know, I, mean, I just didn't let it stop me. Um, the, the main objections we had were, we were young. I mean, we're babies in the field. People don't, you know, they see you and they're like, what are you doing? Or where's now, the GC? Who are you? Who are you? Or, yeah. Like, I'm like, well, we're the owners, <laughs> we're, we're the contractors. And, um, but it just, you know, it just takes that, like that right fit. And that's something that I've learned, you know, you're not a great fit for everybody, you know? And so right off the bat, we, I, I saw that people who hired us were around the same age and it's like, they felt more comfortable. Like, oh yeah, you have four kids. I'm like, oh, you have three kids. Like, yeah, we're, so we found some sort of common ground. And a lot of people were creatives too, which is weird what, you know, the type of people you atta attract because it's kind of yourself as well, right? Um, and then we also, there was a lot of couples that were, you know, um, maybe Latino speaking one and then not the other. And it was just like, even though we're both Latino, like he has a, a little bit of an accent, I don't, but it's kind of like, kind of that way, you know? And so, um, we just it just started from there, you know, those first sales for me, um, it was a learning experience. We always we undercharge by like a lot. But, you know, at first you don't there's no handbook. There's no handbook on it. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's funny. I've spoken about this a lot on the podcast. I mean, even after 20 years, I look back and I'm like, even last year, I'm like, I think I've been under, under I feel like I've been undercharging my whole career. I wonder if every entrepreneur looks back and I wonder if we don't all feel that we've undercharged our entire time. And so, you know, how do you, how do you, 
I mean, obviously you need to make those changes yeah. and that's part of education and networking with other builders and understanding like, you know, and, and saying like, I am good enough. I don't need to practice. Like we are good at what we do and just having the confidence to say, no, this is what I'm worth this. Cause a lot of it is confidence, right? It is confidence. Don't, don't you wish you could almost go back to the beginning yeah. and be like as confident, you know, it sounds like you were conf born confident at five, but <laughs> you know, being confident has a confident has a huge advantage uh, just because, you know, the client is buying you yeah. and I'm saying, this is what it takes to build your house or remodel your house or whatever it is. And that confidence comes with experience. Exactly. And that's the chalk it up to university costs, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> education cost. Um, but for me, it was like, I, I just didn't know, you know, how to get more clients because a lot of people, I don't know if this happened to you when you started, but I, I feel like th there's the whole referrals, there's this, but sometimes when you you go from being a sub, who who's going to refer you, you know, and, the, and our network was only like family members. I mean, I kind of started my whole life again in Minnesota. I didn't have the same friends. I didn't, you know, there was not a lot of networking happening. And I didn't know a lot about, you know, all the networking events. It wasn't until later that I, I stumbled upon certain groups that I, you know, associations that I joined. Um, but other than that, it was just I had to pay for advertising. Excuse me. I even did Angie's leads, mm -hmm. which are rough. I mean, it is so hard, but I sold a lot through them. So I can't say like they suck completely. <laughs> It sucks to get you have to pay for it, the lead. But if you think about it, I mean, Google lead, Google ads, you, you have to pay as well. But because it's more targeted, like they're picking you, which Angie sends everybody the same lead and you're competing for that lead. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, you know, it's like simple sales technique. Like, OK, like, <laughs> let's hear, you know, what's your deciding factor after you've met with all these people? Like, what's going to make you choose the right contractor? So you were really looking for almost, well, really anything to kind of feed the meter, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so in those early days, I'm sure there were, you know, a tile job, a backsplash. I mean, small jobs, big jobs. Oh, yeah, I would take it all. <laughs> we, we take everything. Where are you at today? So now that you've been in business for. I don't do know, tile jobs. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now I, we do additions. I'm trying to focus more on just additions. I love additions. Um, but what we, is it that about additions that you love? Uh, just the process, like from the digging to like seeing the whole structure come together. Um, that like excites me and that makes me want to like start building developments. Like I want like massive. <laughs> well, I wouldn't bet against you. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> um, so I, that's kind of what I feel like we're going towards is just kind of focusing on those additions. Um, and I love doing kitchens and bathrooms. So those are kind of our bread and butter right now. You know, I see you're, you know, you're quite prolific on Instagram and I, I find your sense of humor really endearing. <laughs> How do you, do you find, I mean, you have a, a pretty robust following on Instagram as well for those listening, you know, give it a look at LBR partners, but how, um, how helpful have you found social media avenues to attracting business? Cause you're still doing paid ad or you, how are you still advertising now or where are you getting most of your leads from? We're still doing paid ads. Um, I believe in having a strong presence, um, even if you're still getting leads from Instagram, I wouldn't stop paying for ads um, just because I want my name everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Do you do anything for print ad or mostly everything is digital? Everything is digital. I don't do any printing. Um, for us, social media has helped us not necessarily in getting a ton of leads for work, but in this realm, like it's helped us a lot. Um, we reached out to you for a podcast, but I've been reached out to for other podcasts. I've been reached out for TV. I've been reached out. Uh, recently. I mean, I don't know if I'm you're on Fox. To... You're on Fox. I yeah. Think, right? And they reached out to us. They found us through our blog. Um, so we must be doing something right. Um, and then I had another like casting director, producer people just recently, you well, know, last week. So we're doing an, a casting call tomorrow <laughs> for a national TV show. You know who you should talk to? I can introduce you to. Uh, do you know Brad and Heather Fox from Fox Homes? Mm -mm. They are in Edina. And in fact, we had them on the podcast. We have to have them come back in the episode that we had a mic malfunction. So we have to re-record. Oh. But they were on a reality TV show. Yeah. And so if that's kind of where this is going, they'd be a great resource. I would um, love to talk because, to them because, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a lot of the ins and outs of how it works because it sounds glamorous and it is, but it's a colossal amount of work. And the way I kind of understood the short version, we'll save it for their episode, is, you know, essentially you do it for exposure and then you do it for future 
your leads. Exactly. But you'd have an incredible story. I mean, I don't watch reality TV. I will watch your episodes. <laughs> Yours would be amazing. I would definitely tune in for that. I was telling my husband, like, we could do a little tango dancing while we're on TV. Like, yeah, let's knock this wall down and then do a little twirl or something, make it interesting. You, well, you brought up tango again. So I, <laughs> it's on your website. I, I think you're a very creative writer. Uh, some of the things that you had on your website just made me laugh. Like, you know, it's that you described yourself as a Swiss army knife, which now <laughs> hearing your story, I'm like, you're a Swiss, you are like MacGyver's Swiss army knife times 10. I mean, you can do anything. Um, I had heard, uh, well, before I go there, tell, tell me a little bit about the tango and the chess. Uh, so Raphael. Yeah, he, sorry. I, we didn't, we didn't know. I mean, we didn't know he was supposed to be here, but um, I'm sorry. Like oh, no. I dropped the ball on that one. Um, but yeah, he he used to be a tango instructor on his like free time. Wow. And so he loved doing tango dancing and all of that. I tried to learn. It's not as easy as it looks. It's very. It looks dangerous for a man. <laughs> I was down in Argentina years ago and we went to a tango uh, to watch it. And it is incredible to watch. And uh, anyway, yeah, it's not for the faint of heart. I imagine a lot of sto toes are stepped on and I'm sure a lot of knees go where knees are not supposed to go. Oh, yeah. And a lot of muscle pulling and yeah. It's it's a lot, um, but yeah, he loved doing that, and then he still loves playing chess. Like, he, does he does he still? I mean, are there tango clubs here in Minnesota? I mean, he, what's the tango been, scene in Minneapolis? I don't know. We've been looking, we've been looking, because um, that's one of our our goals this year is to get him back into that. Like, you know, um, I feel bad. Like, it's we're all work and no play. Um, but we need to make more time for that. I mean, you'd be a hit. Have you ever seen the dancing carpenter on Instagram? Mm -mm. Check out the dancing carpenter. He like lip syncs with his uh, his tape measure. <laughs> he's you know he's got several hundred thousand followers. Oh my god! Honestly, gosh. Raphael would be a hit, uh, especially the, the Latino community. Oh yeah, yeah, I would watch that. I mean, a, a tangoing. Uh, yeah, it'd be hilarious. If nothing be else. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. gonna definitely check it out. I would. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what? Um, so going back to you know some of your writing, you know, you know, you talked about. Raphael being the on on site maestro, you know what what is it? How do you guys work together as a husband and wife team now? So I we I we book well here. So we both go together on site. We take measurements. We talk to the client. Um, then I go back home. I put the proposal together, um, send it to the client, and once we get the job, you know we bring in our all our team designers and architects and all of that fun stuff. They're not in house, are they? No. Okay. Um, and then, um, but Raf is the one who executes everything. So he will make sure that everything gets done right and correctly. Um, he's the guy that any questions that the homeowner has about the building process, it's going to be through him. Um, so he's, he's our main guy on the field. I manage all of like the material ordering, like um, material selections, all of that stuff I handle. Um, I also handle if there's any problems on the field and the client wants to talk to me directly, then I handle that too. Um, but yeah, together, I think we're, we're a pretty solid group, like team. And the kids, uh, how old are they now? So the 17 year old who's actually going to U of M <laughs> next year. Full circle. Uh, full circle. Does it I know. feel kind of weird that you have a son going to the University of Minnesota? Yeah. He, he always rubs it in my face. He's like, how's it feel? He's like, I'm actually going. And I'm like, I went. I just didn't finish. I'm like, leave me alone. And then, uh, but he's going for civil engineering. So it feels amazing. And he's got a 4.0. Wow. You see, Nicaraguan would, would have left him back, held him back how many years? Amazing. And 4.0 kid, like he's taking AP classes in high school since sophomore year. Like sophomore, I believe it was. And it was insane um but yeah it's so i have the 17 year old the 12 year old that's going to be 13 on saturday um it's like 13 going on 18 and then my two youngest babies with Raphael are six years old and eight years old emma and hope yeah so we have emma hope juniath and aiden oh that's beautiful i love everything about it <laughs> i've got little ones i've got a eight seven or eight five and four he just Aww. turned four so similar ages on the, on the bottom side there that's awesome. One of the things on your website that was interesting, it, you had just mentioned about upfront, upfront pricing, no hidden costs, no surprises, just clear, honest communication. What does that mean to you? Well, what it means is I don't, I don't, oh man, I don't know. If I'm going to, it's the unpopular opinion. <laughs> Everybody's like, Bell, shut up. I don't like change orders. I hate them. I feel like 
as soon as people bring up change orders, it's like, oh, uh, it's got a bad like. It has you a know, bad rap for sure. It does. it does. And I'm not saying that in certain areas you have to do it, right? And that's what I mean by that. I'm not here to, you know, oh, look, well, this little thing, we didn't see that or here's, you know, no, I'm talking about like we open the wall and if there is mold, obviously we're going to have to mediate and we're going to have to take care, right? Um, and the client can see it. I'm not hiding anything from them. Um, if there's changes in cabinets and it's not like a huge change, you know, but whatever, they want something different or whatever, it, I, I just give them the cost of the whatever it is. And then we talk about our cost. So I'm not trying to make a buck out of the change orders. So if I understand this correctly, there's not like an additional change order fee. Some builders, I don't, will, I don't charge it. Yeah. Right. So, cause some builders will say like, Hey, you have a, let's say you have a $10,000 cabinet allowance Yeah. and you have a, let's call it a hundred dollar change order fee. Or we had Meg Billings on from Utah. I think she has a $350 change order fee actually. And she's trying to de you know, de-incentivize her clients from changing for different reasons. But anyway, long, so it depends on what your strategy is. But yeah. you're saying that if the cost of the cabinetry went up to 11000 you would charge the client 1000 that there's a change in material goods. Yeah. You just would not, quote, penalize them an additional fee on top of that. No. How are you, how are you making money? Are you doing a fixed bid? Are you doing cost plus? Like in that- it's fixed. It's fixed bid. Yeah. So let's say this kitchen job you have, whatever the, the number is that you have in there for a profit, regardless if they do 10,000 in cabinets or 11,000 in cabinets, you're going to keep your number the same. What happens if they add $100,000 of scope to work? Well, that's different. <laughs> that's, that's the, so like, let's say um, I have a client that said, okay, well, we're going from example, I don't remember the measurements, but it was like 10 by 10 deck. Now they want a, you know, 20 by 10, 20 by 16 deck. Um, I treat it as if it were a new project. So it doesn't matter that I'm already there. I'm already there. Why do I need to charge more? I just never, and maybe I'm doing it wrong, Mark, but in my mind, it's like- Well, you talked about undercharging. <laughs> right. So I'm uh, not a consultant. <laughs> well, I guess I sort of am, but you know, I, I would, I mean, based on what you're telling me, I mean, you are, and there is a strategic, like, I don't want to, you would never want to change yeah. like your, what, what feels good to you. Like, I yeah. agree with you. Like if a client is saying, Hey, I'd like to make this small change. And like, that's a way that you can kind of use it as a PR move and like, Hey, you know, with LBR partners, that's not a change. The, 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 yeah. It, that's not really a great considered. move. But I mean, if you are doing work and not charging for it, you're going back to your earlier comment that you're yeah. undercharging for work. And what I agree, I still undercharge for my work. I think everyone undercharges for their work to varying degrees. Yeah. And the question is, is how do we how do we show it to the client in a in a way that they understand like you deserve to be paid for your work? Mm -hmm. Like you're an amazing talent, you're an amazing person, your company, all the things that you're doing, you need to be paid for that. Yeah. And so whether you front load it or whether you backload it or whether you just, you know, have a very clear method, you know, I, I, I think you should be paid for that. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying I'm not charging what I would typically charge. It's just, there's no, I don't see any more fees. You know, I treat it as if it were a new project, you know, I'm not, it's a new project. What, what are my costs already? What I'm already charging? This is what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. Um, I just don't, you know, want to add more, unnecessary because let's say I start hitting them with more fees and I'm not you know again unpopular opinion but if they come to me and they're like well actually it's kind of high I'm just going to hire someone else to do it then I'm just out for $350 change order or whatever change order fees plus whatever extra you know it's just like I just treat it as a new job so if it's like, if it's no longer this much. So give me an example. So like, I know the deck one, I'm not sure I follow that. Let's say you're doing a kitchen for, mm -hmm. let's call it a hundred thousand mm -hmm. and they want to do a bathroom down the hall. You're going to create a separate contract for the $20,000 bathroom remodel, or you're going to add it to the hundred thousand dollar existing contract and just do create quote a change order. So now the contract is 120. How are you handling that? Yeah. That's what it would be. The, the, but where you as morph a it new, together. Yeah. I would morph it together. Right. But it would be. I would treat it as if it were its own project. You know what I'm saying? 
like the cost and everything. So you are you are adding your profit or margin oh, or yeah. markup in oh, yeah. that separate cost. Yeah. Okay, that, that makes not, more sense. There's no there's no like extra fees on anything. Okay, that makes Does, way more yeah, sense. Yeah, I'm sorry okay. I wasn't communicating. No, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> that, that makes way more sense because that now that I understand because I agree with you. You don't want to disincentivize your client from adding meaningful work and margin. Plus, you're already there. They're yeah. already they want to say yes too. Right? Yeah. Everyone here wants to say, yes, you want to do the work. They want you to do the work. You're just trying to remove a hurdle mm -hmm. uh, from them doing it. So yeah, yeah I think that's Where great. I think change orders for me would be like, okay, well, we talked about, we selected this tile and this tile was this much and we already purchased it and it's already there ready to install. And then last minute, oh, we don't want those stuff. That that's when to me that's a change order. And I agree with you, and I, I think too. There's you know times, and and I've evolved over the years in our business practice on how we handle this. I I've, I've never charged the penalty if he actually oddly enough I'm actually thinking about starting starting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of builders do it because you know they want the added profitability, which I understand. Clients hate it. You're right, and so it um, sometimes though it is useful to have it in order to maybe contain a client if they're out of control. And so having some parameters, it, I think that's, it's a hard thing. I think yeah. every builder, every model really has to understand their own business really well. And I think you have to understand your client really well because exactly. it's not for everyone. And some, it's not. some people hate it. Some people would have a real, like, a, you know, you know, I heard recently that, you know, I can dis disappoint you once. So like when you present your contract, you know, the first time it always is more expensive than they think it's going to be. Yeah. And so you can disappoint them once or you can disappoint them a hundred times. And the idea, right, is you, they like, they like the first proposal, but then during the entire build, you hit them with 30, 50 change orders and like, well, why wasn't that included? Why wasn't that included? And so builders do get a bad rap for that stereotype because part of it is trying to appease the client and, you know, we're trying to make them happy. Yeah. So, I mean, have you experienced that? I haven't um, where it's like, crazy ridiculous things but um i just feel that a lot of it though as you know my website says is just kind of knowing like going in and actually looking at everything so like if we're doing in addition and there's going to be new windows and there's going to be doors and there's going to be all these different trims right well well i want this kind of trim i'm like well, you don't want it to match the rest of your home no i want new trim and then I'm like, but you do realize that you're going to have this trim here, but then your windows aren't going to match. Are you okay with that? And then, then it gets them thinking, oh, maybe then I should just change all of the trim. I'm like, okay, so then we should add that now and not later on when we're already starting because then that would be that, – that makes the process longer. It takes more time. It takes materials. It takes a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just like going into it like, thinking about everything. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not, right? Everybody has their things. But I try to think meticulously about every little thing because I do not want any surprises later on. Um, and I've gotten lucky, you know, just by thinking about it. And I'm like, my clients love me and adore me. <laughs> um, they, I do too. They <laughs> really, I'm not even your client. <laughs> but they, they trust me so much yeah. to the point where it's like, I don't know. They feel like family. And to me, that means the world to me. So it's like if we can be clear on communication, clear on scope of work and cost, we're good to go. I would imagine your referrals are probably off the charts then. They've gotten really, really great. I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> it's been amazing. Do you have when you are done with a project, what is kind of your M.O.? for how you end a project in terms of like a gift or rate review or, you know, do you have any referrals you could refer to me? How, how do you sort of do your exit interview with your clients? So um, I recently started doing a kind of a honey book um, kind of experience, like tell us your experience with LBR and you'll get like a gift card or you could pick basically a gift card or we could do like a little basket for you. So kind of incentivize them to actually take the time and answer these like 10 questions. Um, and then at the bottom we'll add, can we use some of the things that you say on social media reviews and things like that? So and I'm not familiar of, with that term HoneyBook. That's a website or what is HoneyBook? Oh, so HoneyBook is, um, hmm, have you heard of Dubsado? No. Okay, so it's kind of like a CR. Uh, it's not even a CRM. It's more for proposal building. Um, so I use it for just that. I love my proposals to my proposals to look very creative and very nice. Um, and I don't want to spend hours typing 
the inf- the like the scope and so I've done it to the point where I kind of have automations for things so I've already have pre-built packages um like bathrooms I already know we have to do plumbing and this, there's a bunch of things that so I've done it now to where proposal takes me maybe an hour or two um so depend once I get my numbers materials just add it in there add the cost and then all the verbiage just pick and choose the verbiage that I want it's kind of like a click and drag type of thing. Oh man, you're making it really easy for clients. I mean, <laughs> that's one of the things I think as custom home builders, you know, regardless if you do cost plus or fixed bid, you know, I look at, you know, big companies, you know, let's, we had uh, Ryan um, Jones on from uh, Stonegate, you know, they build 200 homes a year, but you know, they're building out these modeling and software that, you know, their real estate agent can sit down with a client and with a click of a button, everything's pre-priced all picked out. It sounds like you're even doing that you for, know, for, for smaller remodels. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Good for you. So I, that's kind of the goal. I don't, I don't want to spend time doing too much of something that I don't really need to be doing. So if I can automate things, I'm huge into tech. Um, HoneyBook is like what, 30 bucks a month, I think. Um, and then it gives you amazing proposals. Um, the fee, like you can follow up on clients or leads through there. So you set an automation, automation every like couple days. I want you to follow up with this client. You make the email templates. So in that way, it is kind of like a CRM. Yeah, it but is. It's kind yeah. Of a hybrid. Um, and then that same software allows me to send questionnaires, surveys, um, all kinds of things like design approvals. So you're tracking all your approvals from your clients. You mentioned before that you have drafts people or architects that help you design this. Are you handling all the interior design selections or sometimes depending on the client, you'll have an outside interior designer help as well? Yes, that's exactly how. Okay. <laughs> so, so I both. help. Yeah. I help. Um, and then depending on the type of client, um, if I feel and right now it's more I'm 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 actually handling that like handling that differently. Now I just want to hand it off to somebody else. Um, I just feel that even though I love doing it, I want to focus on the growth of our business and not so much, you know, there's like running the business and actually working in. (laughs) Oh, I'm well aware of that. I feel like I've been working in the business my whole, it's like someone once told me that, um, you know, if you're working in the business, you have a job. And if you're working, working on, on the, the business, business, you have a, you know, you have a business and yeah. I think I have a job, you know, as much <laughs> as I'm trying to work on it. You're doing amazing. Look at, I love this. Just the fact that you're doing your podcast and you're doing your whole business and you're doing a lot. That's fun. I mean, it's fun. <laughs> I mean, we're all trying to, and we're all, well, of course, everyone is usually their own, uh, you know, harshest critic, right? Yeah. You yeah. Know, so there's always things that you can do better. And lighten I up. think, I think we have a very, uh, supportive, do you think we have a very supportive community in Minnesota? I think we do. 100%. And that's kind of why I loved Minnesota. When I first came here, I felt like uh, people here, it felt like being back home in a way where the commu- it was more of a community, like we're here to help, you know, and, and I love that. Are you part of, I know, some of the associations here in Minnesota? I mean, we have Housing First Minnesota and then uh, the Wink Women in Construction. Are you part of those organizations as well? Mm-hmm. Okay. And NARI and um, the one that I joined first was AWC, which is not really residential. It's Association of Women in Construction, um, and they're a nonprofit in St. Paul, and they help women um, with government contracting. And I went into it just because I wanted to join an association where there were women in construction. But those ladies, man, oh my gosh. I was just like so inspired by all the government contracts that they're getting, and it was so amazing, and how the community, like how they help you with any types of questions, even though we're in different um, industries, I suppose, same industry, but just different areas. Um, the way that they were able to help just with little questions, legal, even like, I need a, I need a lawyer to look over my contract and make sure everything's great. Don't worry, we've got you. And that kind of, I was just, I loved it. Do you feel, and it's a hard question to ask because I don't even know how to articulate it. I, you know, I have, my wife is Asian, so my daughter's half. And so as I'm thinking about her future and, you know, wanting more women in, in construction as well, do you feel that, you know, being a minority woman business owner, do you feel like that's an advantage in the day and, and age that we're in now? Is it, is it hard for you? Is it, do you feel like people have preconceived notions? Oh, what's it like? I feel that it, um, it most certainly can be an advantage, um, especially if you are doing government contracting. Yes, very. Like we are DBE certified. We're like we're ready to work with the government if we if we wanted to. We've got all the certifications necessary. 
Um, but when it's residential, sometimes it, just being a woman owned business gets you far. Um, maybe not so much a Latino owned business, even though I shout it out everywhere. Um, but definitely being women owned has helped us a lot. Uh, I mean, I imagine it would. I, I've mentioned this before too. I mean, you know, most of our the people that we work with as clients, we're working with the missus, yeah. right? I mean, it's the home. It's the most personal thing. Even when you mentioned, you know, when your mom and dad moved here, right? Your mom was, you know, the, the, one, home, yeah. the one keeping everything together at home. I mean, you know, I've often joked when we remodeled my house, I, you know, I told my wife, I said, you know, people pay me for my opinion. She's like, I'm not paying you. And so, you know, <laughs> like even as the owner of my company, like I'm working for my yeah. wife, right? Yeah. And so, you know, if you can't relate to women, and so I imagine women are just more empathetic and probably better at it. For sure, they're better at it than men. Yeah. And so. Um, and that for us, that's helped a lot, just that. And then um, Latino, being a Latino here in Minnesota, I've never felt, um, I mean, just one time, but it was just, you know, they were like, oh, I don't even know if they speak English. And I'm like, excuse me, <laughs> I do. And I understand everything you're saying. Oh, my word. Um, but. Other, I mean, it's just been amazing. I feel everybody's here is very open-minded and, and they're not as judgmental and, you know, um, but it's been for me just being woman owned, it's helped a lot. One even can be, I have very poor Spanish and, uh, but I do, I do love, um, you know, South America, we spend a lot of time in Mexico as well, but I, I just love, uh, you know, the Hispanic culture and the people in general, if you were to have a stereotype, they're like very happy people. We are I happy. I just love them. And so it's like, <laughs> you know, and, and they are, they feel, you know, in construction in, in Minnesota, I can only imagine what it's like, obviously further south, but I feel like, you know, a good 30, 40% of the people working on our homes are you know, Latino or Hispanic of, you know, and so it's like, I, in some ways I would like to go back to school and finish. I'm actually terrible at language. I feel like the only way I could really learn Spanish is just be immersed in it. You, yeah. And so I took Spanish in high school, a little bit in college, forgotten most of it, but I, my cousin went to school in Mendoza, Argentina. And so that's where we saw the tango thing back in like 2004, <laughs> I think it was. And, uh, but anyway, I digress. The point of it is, is like, man, within six months, a little bit like you as a five-year-old, you know, you learned it a lot quicker than he did, but I would love to, and it was really important to me that my my kids had a second language and as it turned out we couldn't get into the spanish immersion school and so alas i guess it's you know yeah she'll have to learn it at a later age i guess <laughs> after all for sure but yeah i i think we are happy people and yeah the stereotypes you know suck sometimes but i'm like i feel like they fit us to the t like we I mean, are passionate it's, it's not the worst uh, you work hard and you're happy like that's a great stereotype like and there's a lot of really bad stereotypes out there for different ethnicities yeah, that's a great one and we're passionate and so when you hear us speaking spanish it sounds like we're arguing we're not we're just like loud happy people we're like ah, da, da, you know and it's like speaking a thousand miles an hour um and i enjoy it i mean oh my gosh what well, going on site if there's nobody around right the clients aren't home I'm like, you blast your music as long as you're not bothering neighbors. Yeah. We will go in and there's bachata, there's merengue, there's salsa. And it's like, yeah, let's get going. Like we're dancing. We're I'm like, telling you, you're, you're going to be so a hit. much fun. Raph is going to be a hit. <laughs> I want tango on the construction site. That'd you be will amazing. get some tango. <laughs> I will tell him to. You know. Give them the Curious Builder shout out because I will <laughs> repost that all day long. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. But you're right. I mean, you go to the job sites and I love kind of the community that supports each other too, yeah. right? I mean, think about your dad sponsoring almost a hundred. That's I have some mad respect for your dad. Like that. a lot I of mean, people. there's some things I want to punch him about, but uh, <laughs> it's not my life. But I also love the fact that he sponsored a hundred people. Like that's pretty stand up, Jose. Um, and so, but it, going back to supporting the community, you know, a lot of times you come in at lunch, right? You know, I'll come on the job site, my drywall guys or, you know, whoever's on site and they're all gather around a circle and everyone's sharing food. It's very communal. Yeah, yeah. I love that. It's so, it's a beautiful thing to watch. Yeah. I, I do love and that. And you warm up the tortillas there and yep, you they know, always like got the, the microwave. Yeah. They, they got the three microwave. extension cones or several, my, oh yeah, a hundred percent. They're a little flat top and yeah, that's how we roll. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I love it. That's amazing. Well, I am so glad that you reached out to come on. This has been one of the most enjoyable uh, episodes that I've had to date. And oh, thank just, you. Just the story. I, I'm really, really impressed and inspired by your story. And I hope people means a lot. that listening are as well. And knowing that there's so much opportunity in construction, you know, regardless yes. of your, your background or there's just, there's a place for you. Just go ask and, yeah. go, and go do. And go do. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and don't be afraid to reach out to, to other people and even for guidance. I mean, Yep. That's the hardest part. And I'm here for anybody who needs any help, 
with anything. I'm here for you. Like I'm here. What are some, uh, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to reach you? Uh, they could go through Instagram or they could just reach out to our info at LBR partners and request, you know, just a conversation, whatever questions they have, they can reach out to me. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming on Val. And no, thank uh, you for having I look me. forward to uh, meeting your tango dancing husband you and will. Uh, until next time. <laughs> We're excited to announce that our first live event is now on sale on our website. On May 16th at five o'clock in the North House in Minneapolis, The Curious Builder is gonna be hosting Brad Levitt, Nick Schiffer, Tyler Grace, and Morgan Molitor to a panel discussion about networking, marketing your brand and your business, and all things related to the Contractor Coalition, which is coming to Minneapolis on May 15th through May 19th. If you're looking at leveling up your business, I'd highly recommend attending. For those local here in Minnesota, it's right in your backyard. This would be an amazing time to network with some of the nation's best builders with the best building practices around. Join us for the Contractor Coalition, or if you just want to be there for one night and for enjoy the networking and meet these superstars from around the country, again, that is going to be May 16th at 5 o'clock at the North House. Tickets can be bought at the ContractorCoalitionSummit.com as well as the CuriousBuilderPodcast.com. Hmm. Thanks for listening to the Curious Builder Podcast. If you like what you listen to, please give us a five-star rating and write us a review. It really means a lot. It's a great way for us to just understand what you like about the podcast and what we can keep doing. So like and review, and please share with your friends and family. Find out more at CuriousBuilderPodcast.com.